Hello, my name is Brad Huddleston. Today I'm going to give you an introduction in how to use Oviedo. I've used Oviedo in previous videos to analyze different molecular dynamics simulations, but I haven't really described it in detail. I've really only used it for whatever specific situation we were looking at. So in this video, and in a few upcoming videos, I'm going to show you how to use Oviedo as an analysis tool for molecular dynamics. So let's hop over into Oviedo. First thing, I'm in this video using what is currently the most re up to the most recent version of Oviedo, version 2.9. Um, there will be a few things that are different, and I'll point some of those out. Um, and if you're using a a more updated version. Uh, things might change. I think they're about to change to version 3.0, so that might bring with it some changes. But hopefully most of this will stay relevant, and if not, I'll probably have to update it. All right, so let's get started. First things first, let's look at how you can load files into Oviedo. Now the first way is to press this load button, and that's this file icon over here on the left corner. So there you can go in and select a file and load it in. Now, Oviedo can actually load in, it can recognize several different kinds of files. Um, it can read files from LAMPs, whether that's like a dump file or a data file. It can also read XYZ files, which are a popular uh, atomistic data file. It can read POSCAR files from VASP, and it can read VT VTK type files, including just like surface mesh files and other file types as well. So it can do a lot. We're mostly going to look at uh, LAMP stump files in this video since that's pretty much what we're looking at is uh, MD simulation. So we'll look at LAMP stump files, but just know that it can do a lot of other kinds of files as well. So if you select your file that you want to load and then just click open, you'll see it's loaded into your scene here. Now the other way you can do that if you like keyboard shortcuts is you can press Control i and that'll bring up that same dialog. Finally, and I believe this is new to version 2.9, if you have your uh, folder open, you can actually just drag in and load your file that way. So you can see there's a couple different ways you can do it depending on how you like to operate. So now that we have a data file loaded, let's take a look around the interface here. So you can see here, here's your viewport, and you can see that there are Four different, four different scenes essentially. There are four different views that you get by default. By default, you have one set to perspective, left view, top view, and front view. And this could be could be useful if you want to get all those different views of something as your simulation is running. What I typically end up doing is picking a view and hitting this button down in the bottom right corner of the viewport area and that makes one view bigger and that way I can look at it and it's bigger on my screen. Notice though how when I did this and I rotated this it switched to ortho because it's no longer fixed to that right view and so you can actually change this by clicking on it and then you can put it back on top or you can put it back wherever you'd like, back, etc. Now there are two, two ones that you should uh, know the difference to because they are quite different. We have ortho and we have perspective. And you can tell just by looking at it that there's a difference between these views even though they're both like freely rotating and that. But they don't quite look the same. So this one essentially is taking in the uh, you know, it's taking into account the fact that things that are farther away look smaller. And so you get this uh, more field of view type look where you have it fading into the distance kind of a thing. Where this one does not take that into account and so everything is uh, straight up projected. So depending on what you're trying to do, you might want to use one or the other. I often like this one. Uh, just because it doesn't distort things, but that's up to you. So now let's get to, you've noticed I've been rotating around and panning. Let's actually look at how to do that. 
So there are a couple, there are three, as in most viewport, you know, type 3D modeling or something like that, any of those kind of programs, there are three main, uh, main viewport navigation tools. The first one is rotating. Now I'm doing this just by clicking the left mouse button and rotating around. So this is actually very easy. Panning you can do by clicking the right mouse button and moving around. And then your zoom is the scroll wheel. So you can scroll in, scroll out, and pan with the right mouse button, rotate with the left. Now if that's not really your style, you can also come down here and click the buttons. So you have a zoom button, and this might be nice if you're trying to get a more exact, um, you know, more steady zoom instead of the jumping in and out with the scroll wheel. This can give you a little bit more control. Or you can click the pan button and pan or rotate. Uh, one other thing that's interesting, uh, here there's a field of view one as well, and that looks the same as, as a uh, as zoom, but it's a little bit different. It actually isn't zooming, it's just changing the field of view on the camera, which when you start trying to zoom in a lot, you might actually notice the difference, but anyway. Okay, so that's the ba basic navigation uh, in space, navigation in space tools. Uh, one other thing that we will look at, of course, is this timeline here. And you can see that you can drag this indicator to scroll through your timeline, or you can press the play button for it to play the animation, or you can jump one step at a time with these double arrows, or you can jump to end or beginning, just like that. And if you want to change how fast your animation plays, that will be in here. Okay, so that pretty much covers, well, let me mention one more thing. Basically, these two buttons here. So this will help if you like lose your thing and it's way off over there. If you press this, you can zoom it up so that it fills your space again. And this other one will do that for all four windows. While well, this one will just do it for the active window. Okay, so let's look at now this area on the right hand side. Um, so this is basically your outliner. This has all the information about what is in your system. And there are a couple different sections here. First you see this display section. Under here are all the objects which are being displayed in your system. All the categories of objects really. So for example you have a simu simulation cell, you have particles, and there are actually forces here too. Now you can show that the, these checkboxes are essentially the visibility of those objects. So you can uncheck and you can hide your simulation cell, your particles, or your forces. If we hide the particles, you can actually see the force arrows there. The next section you'll see right now is the input section. And this essentially is where, the, uh, where your input files come in. So you click on that, you'll see information about your input files, and you click on that, you'll see information about your simulation cell. So there's one other section, um, but it's not shown right now because there's nothing in it. So if we add a modifier, you click this Add Modification drop-down menu, and then let's just pick Center Symmetry Parameter. Now if we do that, now you'll see another section called Modifications. So in here is where all your modifiers will go. Let's add another one. Let's add, scroll down here to Color Coding. So there's one important thing to note about these modifications. It's that the order of them matters. They're executed as if it was a stack. So they're executed from, top, from bottom to top. So this one goes first and this one goes second. And you can see why this matters um, with a simple simple example here. So we will go into some of these modifiers later, but just in general, this one creates a property for each of the atoms. And we are now color coding them that by that property. It's called center symmetry. If we were to try to color code the atoms before we created that property, we would not be able to. You see, 
it says that that property is no longer available because it's trying to color code it first and then calculate the center symmetry parameter. So just remember that, that the order of these modif modifiers is very important. Okay, so this is, that's the main part about the outliner here. Now let's jump down into this properties panel. You'll notice that every time you click on something in the outliner, it changes what is displayed in this properties panel. So you can see that for each object in the display, there's different, different properties about how you want them to look. You could make them look very different. Um, and then for each modifier, there's settings on how you want to display that modifier. For example, you can adjust the range of the color or many other things, or what property you want to color by. And that'll be different things for different modifiers. And similar to the display, if you uncheck the modifier, it will actually stop calculating it. So it'll keep it there, but it'll be, if you mouse over that, you see it says it's currently disabled. So that's a, that's a good way to just see what it would look like without one of your modifiers. Now we're actually going to look a little bit closer at the properties panel for the input. So the file that I have loaded right now is actually stored as separate files for each time step. If we look back in this folder, you'll see that I have .0, .250, etc. all the way to .4000. Those are all different time steps of the same simulation. Now it, LAMPS actually assumes that when you have file numbers in your dump files or input files, it assumes that they are consecutive time steps. And so you can see it says it's assumed a file pattern with a star, and so it's found all of the files that have that match this pattern essentially. And so you can go down and you can look at all the different files. And that's the same actually as scrolling through your timeline here. Now if you don't if this is not the case for you, for example, maybe you've named all your files like this, but actually there are, you know, all these different simulations, and this is some name that you've given it. Then you can do one of two things. One thing you can do is change this file pattern to whatever the actual name is. And so now it'll assume that it's just this file that you want to look at. The other thing you can do, and this will actually be necessary, if all your, if all your time steps are in one file, to get all those time steps, you need to come down here under, well, in this case, lamp stump, and you'll say file contains time series. Now, this, this is under lamp stump because not all file formats support being able to have multiple time steps in a single file. But since a dump can have multiple time steps, you have to come here, click this checkbox, and then it'll look through the whole file for all the time steps in that file. Now again, in this case, there's only one time step per file, and so you notice that I, now long, I no longer have any time steps on my timeline. So let's uncheck that and put back the star, because that's actually correct. You can see the deformation. All right, so that's going to be all for this video. This has been a quick overview on uh, the Oviedo's GUI, so I hope this has been useful and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and found it helpful. Keep asking good questions. I enjoy taking your questions and hearing what you guys are up to. If you want to keep up with some of the new videos I'm making, be sure to hit the button at the top of the screen to subscribe. Or check out some of the other videos on my channel by hitting one of the buttons at the bottom of the screen. With that, I'll see you next time.